okay? Yeah. I like this. <laughs> so, I have to thank Miss Mary and Miss Ivy because uh, without their tech support, you would be having to use your vivid imagination to understand what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, none of this would happen, I can promise you. Now, you know, my name is Randy, but my initials are WRK. I take the O out of work. <laughs> extreme bed building and other extreme Webster's extreme far from what is usual or conventional now you're going to have to be the judge at the end of the evening whether this is far from conventional or unusual or usual uh, I have my own ideas about it I think I'm getting feedback from being too close to that so I'm going to step over here huh? okay okay So, yeah. I'm going to move this over here. I've got some, uh, got some cute little visual aids here for later. But one thing I wanted to do, you know, all these ideas, I made a list of top tips. Randy's top tips, I just wanted to share those with you. <laughs> Uh, seriously, uh, we did a lot of thinking about this and we took a lot of pictures while we were doing it, anticipating this, uh, this event. Uh, you know, if you think that building a rose bed is a hard job and onerous and just so bad, so, so something you just don't want to do, well, maybe you want to collect stamps or maybe you want to binge watch Orange is the New Black. Uh, that way the building should be fun. It's, it's exciting because you're creating something. Nobody is going to build a bed exactly like you do. So put yourself into it. Uh, this is when you can show off and get away with it. So the first thing you want to do, of course, is to have a plan. You want to have an idea of what the bed should look like. And I always had a fascination with two particular silhouettes, a map of Texas and a heart. Worldwide, those two are recognized. You see a map of Texas, you see a heart. You don't even have to think about it, you know that. So I wanted to incorporate these two, and so I put my head together and I thought about it a little bit, and I made a map of the heart, and you can see I measured very carefully what my distances would be, and then I superimposed the Texas on it, making some more measurements, and you can see I was pretty serious about some of this stuff. Just because you measure it that way doesn't mean it turns out that way, though. So, I also considered which, uh, which uh, how big should the Texas be? You can see two Texas is there, I ended up going with the bigger one, and finally, I have a final plan that is gridded and scaled, and most importantly, I want to make five or six copies of this at least, probably ten, because you're going to take them outside with you, you're going to get them wet, it will rain on you out there, and you're going to be using them for other things too that we will show you as we go along. So your selected site should be large enough to uh, be able to uh, meet the standard prerequisites and be large enough for your plain garden. Uh, our site was an existing rose bed. Now, that looks pretty nice, but where are the roses? Um, there's one, and there's one, and there's one. What's going on here? Well, it's called live oak trees, and the roots of live oaks literally choked the roses out. They were just really getting scratched. So, first thing you want to do after you make all this planning is get some rest. Serious rest. You're going to need you're going to get charged up when you go out there that first day to get after this work. So you get some rest, and then you get some more. Make sure. You want to be fully energized, and you want to be excited. So, you want to get a few tools together, and you want to get some building materials together, and you go back to your site, and you go, well, <laughs> you know, 
This is going to be a little harder than I thought because after all, when you have an existing bed, what do you have to do first? Deconstruct it. So you're already making extra work for yourself. So, first thing you do is take that bed down to the grade level. This is the back of the arc of the new bed. And here is the old bed that I left. And the new bed is going to be over here. So this grade that I made down to grade level, to the ground level, is the back side of the new bed. And you can see here's an existing rose. There were about five of them that survived. And I made little soil islands, just left them in place and worked around them as long as I could. Now, if you're, uh, you can see, soil islands, very, uh, very easy. You're going to run it across a few roots, and so <laughs> three roots, you, you cut them out, and you set them aside, and before you know it, you've got a big pile of tree roots in my yard. I had about three piles this size before I got done. You also run across uh, little grub worms, we call them June bug larva, they're just little, uh, little worms to us, but to our friends in our backyard, they are delicacies, and if you're just wondering if that could possibly be true, ask Mr. Sunshine. They love them. So, when you, uh, when you're, if you're moving dirt out of your bed site, predetermine what you will be doing with it, because you're going to feel really foolish with your hands on the wheelbarrow full of dirt and you don't know where you're going with it. So you can either use it as a top dressing in the yard. Or you can pile it up as a reserve to reuse. And I did both. So, if I only gave you one tip tonight, it would be wear long sleeves, long pants, and a wide rimmed cap because Mr. Sun is not your friend. Uh, we work outside, I work outside for a career, and uh, you know, uh, after a while at our age, it starts to show up. So take care of yourself as best you can. Here I have actually started trenching, and I use free bar as markers, and uh, there's a grub hoe, one of my favorite tools. And as I dig, I'm going to uncover existing sprinkler pipe, and uh, I'm going to uncover some more, and then some more, and some more. And what you want to do when you uncover this pipe like this is measure and photograph these distances so that when you dig back into the area, you'll have some idea where those pipes are. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Now, the trench that I make for a root barrier, I made it 18 to 24 inches deep. That's about knee deep. And it has to go It has to block the tree roots completely. So in this case, this is my foundation of my house, and I have a 50-foot arc to the sidewalk. So I have a 50-foot trench that I had to dig to really know that I was going to be blocking the tree roots. And um, you can see that I worked around my existing sprinkler pipe, but at some point, you're going to have to cut it because you cannot just leave it there and put your uh, barrier under it because if you do, the roots will use that sprinkler pipe as conduit and it will run right into your bed. You will not be able to block them out. So I cut the pipe and set them below the grade of the barrier. And after I got it set, I could backfill and I could continue on with the trench and I used rebar as a support for the root barriers that I used. And there's a commercial root barrier you can buy online. Uh, I used that on one side, and on the other side, I used 18-wheeler mud flaps that I was able to get at work, and I overlapped them. I was, I was very generous uh, with uh, the way I put them in there. And you can see that uh, it's time now to backfill. 
I did not want to just put dirt back in there, and I had threatened rebar and concrete with Mary, thought about dropping cinder blocks and concrete in there, and Mary said, hey, don't do that. Somebody told me about crushed granite. I don't know who, I wish I could thank them. It's a great product. It's a little heavier than sand, than, uh, than mulch, but it's lighter than sand. It handles really well. Uh, it has a, 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 a substance to it, so you can see I lower the gate, and it's still there. Now, when I unloaded it, I used mud flaps on the, on the bed of the truck. It made it really easy to just shovel out, uh, just uh, made it simple. So I backfilled the trench, and I only did half of the trench at a time. Well, why is that? Well, because you're going to need access to both sides as you're going. If it's, a, if it's an arc all the way across the yard, you've got a moat you've got to cross every time you've got to work on the other side. So I only did half, and then I did the other half. And this also helped mitigate the rain that is inevitable. There were days when I went out there and it was standing in water. Well, I could do something else while I was waiting on that to dry it out. And so uh, I did half, and then, you know, you kind of take a breath and you're going, oh, this is starting to wear me out a little bit. I'm feeling kind of ragged on the edges, so I think I will take a power nap. And that will make me feel refreshed. So I get back out there, and it's time to uh, get those... Uh, Get my uh, granite set, and I want to back up to this to show you. This is an idea that didn't work. Uh, I wanted to edge the bed with the brick, and because I've got a substantial grade drop, uh, I had uh, a logistical problem with that that I could not uh, navigate, so I had to ditch that idea. But you know, don't be afraid to try something. Uh, if it doesn't work, that's okay. Stay flexible. Uh, you know, sometimes your best ideas come when you're down here just grubbing around. So, we get backfilled, and then we have our issue of our soil islands and our trees on the islands. How are we going to deal with these guys? They are too big to lift. You can't, if I were to chop the, the soil out from around it, I would probably kill the bush. So, I thought about that, and I decided... That, uh, and you may be asking, what, why, what keeps the soil together? Look, these are tree roots. These are tree roots. This is what we were dealing with. So the, the tree roots actually held the soil together, uh, so they kind of helped me in that respect. I took my mud flaps and I made a runway, and I took a uh, tarp, and I got it up next to the, the soil, and I wedged it up under the soil, and I used shovels, Popped it up, you can see there's the gray clay. Popped it up onto this, uh, <laughs> onto the tarp. And then once I got it completely onto the tarp, I could drag it out of the way on my runway. I could drag it up and it would be completely out of the way, out of harm's way. And I did uh, keep these guys watered as I went along and they, Every one of these survived. I was amazed. I had no fatalities on these uh, on these roses that I handled this way. They they all made it through the year, and I was really encouraged by that. So now I have to give a hand uh, and, a, and a shout out and a thanks to Dan Lawler because we wanted to use our old dirt and we tested the pH and it was way high. It was 7.8 and it ought to be 6.5. Mary called Dan and he says, well, you know, you can put sulfur on it and that'll bring it down and you can use two applications. And that's exactly what we did. I put an application here and I put an application on the soil reserve pile. And we never did retest it, but we were pretty happy with the results. So you can see the water, the rain has kind of washed it in right there. And now it's time to go back to the map. This is the same map, but I have done something different now. I have set the risers for the sprinkler pipe, and I want them at equal distances. And you can see I've got these little triangles. I was very busy on this little plant. So I wanted equidistant uh, risers uh, so that I would saturate the bed evenly. And so once I established that, I figured out how I was gonna run the pipe. And uh, then I got down and uh, started digging the pipe. And uh, you, you trench it out and you uh, 
you uh, lay the pipe in. And plastic pipe is a wonderful thing it, 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 as long as you remember to use uh, not only the glue, but the, uh, the pre-glue, if you will. Uh, I built a bit without it once and it came apart after about two years. I didn't, didn't understand it until then. I want you to see here that I've actually got only one circuit supplying this bed and I split it with two valves so that I could run half of the bed at a time if our water pressure was not substantial enough. As it turns out, that wasn't a problem. And I've got to say this too, you'll, you'll be able to come up here and see this later. This is thin wall pipe. This is thick wall, Schedule 40. Never, never, never use thin wall pipe. This is a dead low hammer. Believe me, if I did that on the ground, it would just shatter. If you hit it with a shovel, it, it's gone, and you, you've just got more work to do. So all, I always use thick wall pipe. It's more expensive. You can't bend it like you can with a thin wall, but uh, it isn't worth the aggravation. And here again, I split another circuit into two. You, you know, I was just trying to figure out how I can utilize this completely. So I got all my risers set, and uh, you can see that I've got all the risers in the bed now. I, I capped them off. And I'm ready to go on to the uh, to the next thing. <laughs> and the next thing happens to be uh, to backfill. And I used extra uh, granite. You could use sand. You could use anything that was different than the texture of your dirt. So that when you're shoveling and you hit it, you go, "Oh, I've got pipe here." That's uh, that's always kind of handy. So I backfilled all my pipe, and you can see the mud flaps. Uh, they were very handy to use as a walkway because, uh, you know, when it got wet and muddy, I wasn't cracking the dirt everywhere. You can also, I also used mud flaps or you could use a hard plastic to cover the pipe. Once again, I, if I hit this, uh, this mud flap, I'm going to know I've got pipe under it and I'm going to be real careful with it. So I have finally finished my underground digging at this point. And so it's time to play King of the Socket. Uh, afternoon, I would go in and take a break with these little kittens, and it would just be really refreshing to watch these little guys play. They were they were a delight. When I went back outside, the very next thing to do now was to finally set the stones of the outside heart. You can see a level right here, four foot level. I used two of them, and my whole thing is to keep the grade level. And we'll get more into that in just a minute. You'll see why. But uh, you can see I'm working my way down, and I am getting that outside heart shaped up. It's looking pretty good. And now you can see that I am flat all the way across. And the reason for that, I've got a 12-inch break drop. If you look at this, I've got five stones on this outside, but I've only got two on the other side. And in Mary's handout, it says eight inches. These stones are about four inches. So you need at least two stones so I've got two here and five here, and my grade is flat. And the reason for that is water runs downhill, doesn't it? And if you do not have a flat grade, you're going to end up with a wet side over, over here and a dry side over here as the water runs downhill. So flat grade is helpful. Then the next thing to do is to work on my inside, my inside heart. And uh, that was pretty easy. But then I got to the Texas, you can see that I used strings uh, that matched up with my grid. I call this the string theory. Uh, and uh, it works, it works. I, I have to, you know, they, they were right, string theory. Uh, the Texas was a little different though. You know, it, it's, it's an odd shape. Uh, how are you gonna get that done? How, how do you plot that out in this yard? Well. Here, one more thing about the level. I am setting the level of the grade of the inside heart to match the grade of the outside heart, and I'm checking my stones that I'm going to use for the Texans to uh, see that they're going to be at the right height uh, proportionately. So here's the Texans, and how do I get it done? Well, see these little colored rectangles here? That's what these guys are. I could put this down in the yard and line it up with my map. 
and I could plot Texas out to an inch. I mean, actually, the margin of error was a little bit more than that. When I first started, I started over here, and I moved around this way, and I came all around here, and by the time I got to here, I was about this far off. So the second time I started here, I went down here, I stopped in El Paso, went up here, got up to here, and I had these three straight lines for the fudge factor. And nobody can tell, just two and three. So by using these grids, and here's, here's a, another, you can see one end is open. And that is, if I put it down next to this, it matches up, it lines up. If I use two that, uh, that have the sides on them, I have to overlap them and it's a little bit awkward. This, this was a key to making this plant work. And these are 10 inch squares and my grids were a scale of 10. I used the, uh, the, uh, the 10 rather than the 12. It just really worked better for me. And uh, I was able to take my tomato steaks and plot it out, you, you can see. 10 inch square grids. And so I was able to plot it out all the way around. And it works good. So I've got my grid, and now it's time to set the stones. And I was going to use these stones horizontally. That's how they're designed. You can see there's a hump in a valley. And they're designed to be horizontal to fit into each other. You see the valley and the hump. Well, I was going to do it that way, and Mary says, oh, that's so much cutting. I listened to what she said, and uh, I looked out on the patio stacked up, and I had all these, all these humps all lined up straight across, and I'm, man, that looks, looks pretty good. And so I changed my plan, and it really worked out well, and I wouldn't have thought of it uh, by myself. So listen to other people. They have some good ideas sometimes, and uh, it, it can do no harm to listen to what other people have to say. So I'm uh, getting the stone set, and now I go back and I'm checking my risers one more time. Here's the plan that I use for the risers. And I go out with a pencil and a pad, and I make a rough plan, and I remeasure, and I find out uh, this one didn't quite get to where it was supposed to be, and this one's a little bit off. So I can adjust that now. When I set the risers, I can adjust that by using an L shape on the riser. This L shape not only allows you the flexibility of setting the riser exactly where you want it, but it also gives you flexibility uh, when you happen to kick or step on it, it's going to give you, it's going to give us some. If, if, if you have a straight up riser and you kick it, <laughs> it's going to break and you're going to replace it and you're going to be nah, nah, nah. so uh, the L shape is a, it's a real key for me. It worked out really well because I could rotate this in any way. I could make this extended or not, and I could get that riser exactly where I wanted. So as I'm laying down the Texas stone, I use the uh, I use the the uh, shale, this is shale now. This is a wonderful product. And it uh, not only drains, but it absorbs moisture and then kind of slow release. So it's a wonderful thing. We mix it in with the soil. And I also used it for drainage. And I set these Texas stones on top of the shale as I put them in their final <coughs> placement. And not only that, but I took weed blocker fabric and I rolled up the shell in the wheat blocker and I lined it on both sides, inside and outside on the Texas. So that uh, when the water hit the bottom of that Texas from the inside, that it would drain outside. You can see all the way around. Now on the inside heart, I simply took the weed blocker and I lined the inside to try to keep that inside dirt from rolling out and, and blocking up these stones. I also did the same thing now on the outside heart, on the inside edge of the outside heart. I've got the weed blocker fabric and I've got the shale rolled up in there. Now shale is uh, lighter than granite, it is really easy to handle. Uh, and Mary wrote this out for us and this kind of explains it. <coughs> I want you to, I already told you about the pH being 7 eight and we were trying to get to six five 
And we spread it out in the driveway, and we mixed everything up in it. And 485 gallon bucket loads to backfill the bed over four days. And you're going, really? 480. Well, how did you count that? Did you have, did you have somebody tally in that for you? That, uh, you know, that kind of, kind of sounds like, uh, see, there's the dirt that I worked off of, and, and, and there's the mulch pile. Here's a tip. Don't, don't mix garden hoses and plastic bags and bricks in with your mulch. It really doesn't work out too well. So 480 bucket loads, please. There's, there's the alfalfa uh, mixed on the driveway. 408 bucket That sounds like, a, sounds like here I am throwing the shale out of the back of the truck. That's, that's nice. That was a lot easier than shoveling it out the back. It's so light, <laughs> you just throw it onto the pile and mix it. 480, but please, that sounds like a fish story, doesn't it? <laughs> well, in fact, I use my tomato steaks to count. And as I, I my wheelbarrow held three five-gallon buckets. As I filled up each set of uh, three-gallon buckets and put them on the wheelbarrow, I bent over and I put a a you know, tomato steak down vertically, and when I got to four, um, the next one went horizontally to make five. So I counted them this way, and I didn't miss too many. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a repeated task, and you kind of lose your mind after a while, but uh, I was pretty conscientious about this, and I know that I'm pretty spot on with my, uh, with my count. And that would be 2,400 gallons of dirt. So, here is the last man standing in terms of the roses that I had to move. And I left that puppy there until the last minute. You can see, even though I had set my stones here, I took them down. I moved these stones back and forth more times than I could count. But I had to have my access into the bed here. So I allowed this bush to stay here until the last minute. And uh, then I moved it the same way I moved the others. And you can see I used the mud flaps to work off of. As I backfilled, I could walk on the mud flaps instead of on the dirt. And uh, it, it was a safety factor, too, for that matter. So uh, here's my old map. And what are we doing with it now? Well, guess what? I need to de determine how the risers are going to be functioning. Should I have a half circle or should I have a full circle? Uh, this was my map to determine that, and here's one that I said, well, I'm, I'm a little off on this one, I need to move that one. So, uh, this uh, allowed me to know how many of which type of head I needed to have on hand when I went out there and put the heads on these risers. And here's our map again, now what are we doing? Well, guess what? This is the best part. This is where we plant the roses, and each of these little pink dots is one of the rose bushes and it's got a number on it. And we use those numbers to keep up with roses. And my partner, she wrote not only the name of the rose, but the number on these tags. And I could take these stakes out there and I could plug them into the right place and we would know that we were getting the right rose in the right place and I only, I only messed up on one of them. And I, I, I fixed it, but uh, you can see I'm still using my level. And you can see, this is only, looks like it's only three stones high, whereas in fact it's uh, six, I believe, or seven uh, deep. But uh, it, it's the visual uh, perception that you want to. And this rose right here, I have to say briefly, on this trellis, this is our heritage rose. This is a rose that came into the United States, was imported in 1890 by Mary's great grandparents when they brought her grandmother from Wales and immigrated through the port of Galveston and settled in Angleton. This bush was in their front garden, Angleton. In 75, we went down there and dug it up, put it in Mary's front yard, and Mary got some cuttings from strike. It's a white climber. Uh, it's a lovely thing. We have no idea what the name is, but it doesn't matter. This is, this is a really special rose, and there really wasn't any doubt when the time came what was going to go in the inside heart. So, I am planting away, and the first thing I did, besides uh, the, uh, the heritage rose, was I replanted all the old roses. And I just used the tarp again, I dragged them over, and I set them in, and got them oriented, settled them in, and, and they liked it. 
And so now I go back through the rest of the bed and I planned it out. And uh, it's uh, turning out pretty good. And I'm thinking, well, gee, uh, it looks like I'm finished here. Except, uh, what's this? It's another hole. I thought I was finished digging holes. Well, Mary says, you know, I can't get into it. It's three steps, two steps even. Need some help here. How about a handrail and some steps? So that's what this is about. I dug a couple of holes and went to my plastic pipe and I set it in the ground and I painted the top of it brown to kind of blend in and I used a little engineering with the double handrail system. It is super stable and I used rebar in the uh, vertical uh, to also give it more strength and stability and anchor. And so we got a handrail there and it makes it real nice. It doesn't show in this picture. But this is the completed bed built out and here I am finally sitting on my ass. <laughs> going, hey, we did it. And as they came out to bloom, uh, they turned out pretty good. Mary planted this sweet alyssum, which uh, mitigates the, the heat off of these stones. And what made this picture better was having this ivy here stand behind the rail. And the only thing I like better than that in my yard is to go out in the backyard and see one of Mary's or Ivy's roses. This is one of Ivy's roses that she hybridized. And it is the sweetest smelling Roads I have ever come across. It's like fringe perfume is out of sight. So, as I said earlier, my initials are WRK and I take the O out of work. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions, but I, I think I've put you into sensory overload. Yeah. Yes, sir. A uh, couple of things on the timing. When did you start that? What month? I started in October, October. and I finished in April. Uh, yeah, <laughs> what's this? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was here before last. It was here before last. Yeah, Dave. Uh, I have two questions. For those people who in here that might be freaking out because they have to have mud flats and all this other stuff. <laughs> Is it necessary, in your opinion, to put in tree root barrier if you're not working around big trees? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. But you saw what we were dealing with. Our, we love our live oak trees. They are magnificent. They're majestic. We love them. We don't want to hurt them. We just want to share the space. And, and the only way we could do that in our yard was with root barrier. And I had tried all kinds of repairs and nothing else had worked. Go and your second question. My second question is, did you get the expanded shale in its pristine condition or mix from Southwest Fertilizer? No, no, I, I got it uh, by the load out at uh, uh, Roundup okay. and by the truckload, $138, and I think it was about six truckloads before I got done, and, and the same on the granite, I got that from them as well. And they just dropped it into the back of my truck and. Uh, they're out off of the, the West Sam, and I was always very careful about the time of the day that I went out there so that I wasn't in traffic. Because especially with, with the granite, you've got this bouncy, bouncy on it because of this load on the back. But uh, it, it was sweet. Baxter? I was curious, just to, did you put a price on all of that? <laughs> you know, we have two pure indulgences in the, at our house. Our daughter and our road garden. I don't want to know what either one costs. <laughs> well, Brittany, I had a question about the root barrier because it looks very, very substantial. Uh -huh. So, I mean, so you feel certain, I mean... Oh, no, oh, no, yeah. oh, no, 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 no. And, and that was one of the things I, I, I meant to mention. You want the barrier to be above grade. You don't want it to be at or below grade because the tree roots will actually literally come up to it and climb over it. Right. I've seen this in my garden, it's crazy. So if, if they're above grade and they're too high, you can cut them with a sawzall really easy. When they were too low, I was actually able to take vice grips and pull them up before they were settled in. But that, that's a lot harder. And, and set them up a little high, it's always easier to trim them on. Yeah, and those those tree roots, they'll run 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That, you know, the conventional wisdom is you want to plant outside the drip line. Well, that's okay for the lights, but that doesn't get it for the roots. The roots are going to be way up past the drip line, and because our trees are on the north side of the lot, they grow toward the sun to the south, so they are always coming toward us. And uh, about a foot a year, it doesn't seem like they're growing very fast, but I've I looked at an old picture and went, wow, I can't believe the way that tree is grown. They'll grow out toward the south at least about a foot a year. And, uh, we have planted a bed in this particular location three times, and each time we had to move it further south because the trees are just uh, coming on. It's great. It's, it's beautiful. We, we love our trees. It's an iconic address, Brayburn Drive in Bel Air. Overarching trees, I mean, uh, we're blessed. We're blessed to live there. We, we really... Uh, are uh, uh, blessed. There's no other word for it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I don't have a question. I just want to say I'm totally exhausted. Well, you know, here's the thing. Uh, the early part, the trenching, that, that's, that's the grunt work. And you just have to put your mind set that you're going to get through that part. Once, once I got through the trenching, then the rest of it, I was using my creative juices, and, and I, I was excited to get out to reach the day. Yeah, yeah, and, and yes, ma'am. My son and I gave Mary a ride home a few months ago, for two days, all he talked about was that flower bed. Well, that's, that's wonderful to hear. You know, we, we do live on a corner, and we have all this feedback from the neighbors, too, and the walking, and I, I got a lot of feedback from them as I was planting it and, and building it. And uh, it was it was a delight to get the positive feedback because they all appreciated what we were doing. But uh, there was more than one of them says, I think they're a little bit crazy. How big is it? Perspective. Yes, it's uh, it's about 50 feet across on, on the outside heart, uh, hip, hip to hip, it, it's about 50 feet. So that is from me to the glass. That's, that's, that's the outside width of the big heart. It holds about 50 roses, 50 roses of varying sizes. And also, uh, Mary's point there, you know, I talk about the great drop, 12 inch great drop where we only had eight inches of soil, Mary planned the many florets that have smaller roots. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of that. And uh, it, over on the, on, the, on the deep side, we could plant the hybrid teas and the things with big roots, not worry about it. But on that, on that narrow side, Mary thought it out and she planned uh, accordingly. And, and uh, you can see, we've been delighted with the results. It's, it's just been a beautiful garden. Any other questions? We want it to be on Robinson. Well, you know. Well, we're not on the east side of town. We want to be on the south side. We, uh, <laughs> we, we are on the corner, and we welcome people to stop by any time. Uh, if, we, if we're there, we're glad to show you around. Uh, particularly, I'll, I'll walk into the back, and I'll show you the, the one of the kinds that we have, uh, the creations of uh, Mary's and Ivy's. And, you can get a sense of how we have um, sort of uh, developed our style uh, with, uh, originally I used landscape timbers. I built the same bed out of landscape timbers in 1990, and it took 200 landscape timbers. I remember that. And I, I tried to ballpark what it cost faster, and after I went over a certain threshold number, I said, no. Uh, I don't want to know. Uh, uh, and uh, so, no, I picked them up 50 at a time at, at Home Depot. And uh, unfortunately, EPA got after the, the landscape uh, timber industry and they changed the formulation of what they put into them. And they simply don't hold up anymore. I had landscape timbers from our old house that I put in in 1980, and they outlived the ones that I, that I laid in 1990. Eventually, they just disintegrated. I still have some in the yard, but they're not doing anything. Yes? So what's next? Is it that yard? Are you to Texas? Are they Texas? Well, actually, my, I, 
My next plan in the backyard is to relocate the turtle habitat because if I move them toward the ash tree, I have enough room for one more exhibition size bed and that would hold about 12, 15 roses and uh, nothing real fancy, just a nice round rectangle. I, I don't like any creatives too much. So, yeah, that, that's really all I'm thinking, but uh, I haven't thought that through because uh, there are issues. We have an ash tree and we have a magnolia tree. Uh, they are, they're, they're tough, but the root systems on the magnolia are even stronger than the ash. And, and they're all up into Mary's garden now, and, and uh, I did put a barrier down when I built those beds back there, but it, it was no match to these tree roots. I'm anxious to see how this works because I'm not absolutely convinced that I that I've won this war yet. It's, it's amazing how industrious they, they sense the fertilizer in, in your rose garden, and they, they are they're magnetically attracted to it. They just come and get it, and, and they choke the rose versus out. That's all. Uh huh. Anything else? Well, I can thank you. It has been my delight to be here. One block west of Chimney Rock on Ray Bernard Alder. Wow.